Well, good morning. morning. Man, wasn't that good with the kids? It's so good. Come on. I love that. Um, How many of you guys were here for last week? Katie preached an amazing message on God with us. Emmanuel. If you missed it, I really encourage you to check it out on our YouTube channel or on our website. I don't know about you, but I've been reminded several times this past week just to say law, to pause and to reflect, remember, acknowledge that God is with me and just enjoy that, settle into that moment. Um, It's been really special for me. Um, Jesus is Emmanuel. He's God with us. That's what Emmanuel means. Uh, John put it this way in his gospel, John 1, 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. I want to preach to you this morning from the thought, why did Jesus cross the road? Let's take a minute to pray. God, we thank you for this morning. I thank you for every person here and for your great love for each of us. I thank you for this Christmas season. And I ask this morning that you would restore our sense of wonder. Would you open up our eyes to see Jesus this morning? Amen. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among among us. So we know that the word is Jesus Christ. Uh, When you look at the first verses of John's gospel, if we rewind to John 1 verse 1, 14 verses earlier, it says this, and it reads very similarly to Genesis 1-1, the very beginning of the Bible. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. So Jesus is the word. In the beginning, God already existed as the Trinity. Three persons, one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so when he created mankind, we see it. He says, let us create mankind in our image. Not I, me, it's in the plural. Jesus is the word of God, and we know that through him, everything was created. And what we celebrate in this season is that the word who existed for all of eternity past came, and he became flesh and blood, and he came close. The God of the universe entered into his creation as a man. And again, as Katie talked about last week, he became Emmanuel, God with us, in the person of Jesus Christ. I love the way the message paraphrase puts John 1.14. It says, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. I like that imagery. Jesus moved in. He left the comforts of heaven to experience the human experience. But why? Why did he do that? For those of us that, you know, many of us here, most of us, have heard the Christmas story a lot of times. We've driven around. I don't know how many manger scenes you've seen. I've seen a whole bunch. We drove around looking at some Christmas lights last night, as a matter of fact. And, you know, we've sang the carols. And it can be easy for us to lose our sense of wonder. We, we start to become familiar. And it's just like, oh, yeah, the Christmas. Yeah, I know it's about Jesus. Okay, cool. I've been struck, though, this Christmas season in particular with this one story that Jesus told it's given me kind of a new perspective on what we celebrate this time of year. And my, my prayer is that as we take some time to look at it together this morning, that it would bring you from wherever you are to a greater sense of wonder at Jesus and at what God has done for us and what we celebrate in this season. So the story that Jesus told is in Luke chapter 10, if you want to follow along. Luke chapter 10, we're going to pick it up in verse 25. If you didn't bring a Bible, that's okay. We've got it all up here on the screen for you. Luke 10, verse 25, it says, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, who asked the question? What does it say? So, this man knows what he should do. That phrase, expert in the law, is actually one word in the Greek language that the Bible was originally written in, and it means lawyer. So for the Jewish people, the Bible was the foundation for their law. There's no like separation of church and state, that kind of stuff. The Bible was the foundation for all of their laws. And so this guy was a Jewish attorney or a scripture lawyer. So picture somebody who's been highly educated, graduated with honors. Now his profession is that he is a specialist in interpreting the Old Testament and applying its teachings in the teachings of the Bible. So he's not dumb. His job 
is to answer questions like this. But he brings Jesus a very simple one, but a big one. And he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What's written in the law? Jesus replied, verse 26. How do you read it? He, the Bible expert, answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. So Jesus applauds him. He's like, correct. Love God with everything that you've got and love your neighbor as yourself. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, who's my neighbor? Who who really, have you ever wanted to justify yourself? I know the scripture says to obey the laws of the land, but drive the speed limit. Come on, like that's not really included. Like everybody goes at least five over. I know the Bible says not to let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but like what if the joke is really funny? Like it's not really hurting anybody. I can tell it's not really a big deal, right? I know the scripture says not to lie, but you know, I I just don't want to tell them the truth is going to hurt their feelings. I'm trying to protect them. You know, surely God did not mean don't lie anytime. There's got to be exceptions, right? You notice our tendency to kind of explain away some of the commands of God? This is what the expert is hoping that Jesus is going to help him do. Like, Jesus, come on, help me out. Like, who really is my neighbor? And he's probably hoping Jesus is going to be like, well, yeah, the guy who lives next door to you. I mean, I like that guy. I'm nice to him. But I hope Jesus doesn't say my coworker, right? Like, or if you're in school, I hope he doesn't say my classmate because there's a kid in my third period I'm about to... How many of you recognize it's our human nature to want to pick and choose the people that we love? Who really is my my neighbor? Who do I really have to love, Jesus? And he responds, Jesus responds by telling him this story. In reply, Jesus said, verse 30, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he was, when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, just a side note here, Jews and Samaritans did not associate with each other. Enemies. So when this Jewish expert in the law hears the name Samaritan or the word Samaritan, he would have cringed. But a Samaritan, Jesus said, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him. Everybody say, cross the road. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Then Jesus asked the question at the end of the story, which of these three, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan, do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So the story starts, this guy gets jumped as he's traveling down the road by robbers. They rip his clothes off, they steal his Nikes, they beat him up, and they leave him half dead. Can you picture him? Can you picture him on the side of the road? He's laying there, mostly, if not completely naked, bruised, laying in his own blood, but still alive. The priest is the first one to arrive on the scene, shortly followed by the Levite, who was the temple assistant. They both served in the temple. So I want you to get the picture of who these guys are. They both had been in Jerusalem. They'd been in the temple. They had been in God's presence. They knew the scriptures. They knew all about loving God and loving your neighbor. They knew all this stuff. But what did they each do when they saw the man who was in need? They put their heads down. They tried not to make eye contact. I'm just going to roll on this side of the road. First the priest, then the temple assistant. But before we judge them, I wonder how many of us do the same thing. Like we might have this amazing time with God and worship on a Sunday morning, and then we pull out of the parking lot here, and then we see somebody who's begging on the street corner, and we're like, dude, roll the windows up, and like, just don't, you know, lock the doors. 
Or somebody texts you this afternoon and they're asking for help with something and all you can think is like, dang, my read receipts are on. Like, they're going to know I saw this text. I got to come up with some excuse now. Like, why can't I help? We know the right thing to do. We know that God loves us and he pours his spirit into us and we get to go and take that and love and give it away to the people around us. But instead, we often will go out of our way to avoid having to give away the love that God's given us. The priest and the temple assistant, they both walk by on the other side, but then the Samaritan man comes rolling down. Now, again, Jews, they considered Samaritans enemies. Jews would not get caught speaking to, his, to a Samaritan. As a matter of fact, when Jesus once approached a Samaritan woman, she was like, how are you talking to me because I'm a, I'm a Samaritan? Jews don't associate. You guys don't do that. It totally caught her off guard. So the Samaritan, he sees this Jewish man in the gutter, and it's essentially he's seeing his enemy that's just laying there bleeding. Surely this guy, if anybody has reasons, this guy has reasons not to stop. But in the story of the three, the only one with reasonable excuse not to help was the only one that did. Why did the Samaritan man cross the road? Not a joke. Jesus said when he saw him, he took pity on him. He was motivated by pity, by love. He felt something in his heart. He felt compassion rise up. And here's the truth. If you care, you'll do something. If you really care, you'll do something. We know that Jesus is telling us this story to teach us about loving our neighbors, but I can't help but see how this points to what God has done for us. Let me ask you, did the Samaritan man cause this guy's problem? You can talk back, that's okay. No? Okay. Uh, he wasn't even present when the robbers attacked the man. It wasn't his problem. It wasn't his responsibility. Was it God's fault that we sinned? It wasn't his problem. It's not his responsibility to fix the situation. The reality is, is that every problem, all the brokenness and the pain and the sickness and the death and the war and all the chaos, all the things that are happening in the world that mankind is experiencing, it's mankind's fault because of sin. It's not that God wronged us and abandoned us. It's that we wronged God and turned our backs on him. Every single one of us have done it. We made God our enemy. And so he had every reason, every excuse not to help. But this is the God that we serve, that he chose to get involved. He chose to cross the road. John 3, 16, one of the most famous scriptures, for God, what? So loved he so loved. There was this love that was, it was not just that he loved, like he had so much love inside of him that he could not contain. Somebody's got to do something. Romans 5, 8 says that, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. How many of you guys are thankful that God didn't just say, hey, I love you, but he demonstrated it. There's action. He so loved the world that he gave. And Romans 5, 8 says that he demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, while we were still enemies of God, before we could do anything to earn anything good, he sent his son Jesus to die for us. I imagine the Samaritan man seeing the Jew like, oh no, like he's a Jew. Like he, this, this guy and all of his people, they refuse to associate with me. He might get offended if I try to help him. But somebody's got to do something and I'm the only one here. I'm the only one present that's able to do anything for this man. If I walk by, who knows what's going to happen? And the reality is, is that for you and I, even if we turn our backs on God, even if you have moments or times or years or decades that you get angry with God and you refuse to pray, you refuse to turn to him, maybe even tell him, I don't even believe in God anymore and, and I don't even want you around if you do exist. Guess what? Even in those spaces, he still crosses the road. He still draws near to help. In verse 34, it said that he went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He could have stopped there and like felt really good about himself, don't you think? Like I just stopped. I took 20 minutes out of my day, my busy schedule to help out my enemy. I poured out, sacrificed my oil, my wine, my supplies to bandage him up like somebody else can take it from here. I'm feeling pretty good about myself. I'm going to go tell somebody about how awesome I am. I'll make sure to get like a quick picture. Hey, look over here real quick. 
But no. He takes the man, he puts him on his donkey, and he brings him to an inn and takes care of him. Like, get the picture, okay? Totally different culture and context. The donkey is the Samaritan man's ride. Like, this is his Lexus. Like, if you drive, imagine not just giving the bleeding homeless person 20 bucks, but putting them inside your car and driving them somewhere to get help. Surely, even at that, he's gone far enough. But no, he buys a hotel room, and he doesn't just pawn him off in there. He goes in, and he takes care of him. So I picture that. Like, I don't know what he did. He laying him on the bed, changing bandages, feeding him. He's up all night, staying there next to the guy, making sure he's okay. And then the next day, it says in verse 35, he took out two denarii. A denarius was one day's, the equivalent of one day's wage. So what do you make in two, in, in two days? Two days of good work. He gives that equivalent, he gives that to the innkeeper and he says, please take care of him. If it takes any, money, any more money than that to restore him to full health, spend it. I'll pay you back whatever it, whatever it costs when I come back. Isn't that what God did for us? He didn't just give us a couple days' wages. He gave us his son. And we celebrate that Jesus was born at Christmas, but the significance is is that the story doesn't end there. That's just the beginning. That eventually, he gave whatever it costs. I'm giving this up front. My son is coming but I'm actually going to do whatever it costs and spare no expense so that you can be saved. Because if nobody else helps you, even if everybody else tried, I'm the only one who has the ability to help you. And so he spares no expense to the point that it costs Jesus his life. You know, we look at the story and when I read it at first glance, I'm like, man, that guy went the extra mile, you know? Anybody agree with that? He just went the extra mile. He just kept going and going and going and spared no expense. But Jesus called it something else. He called it loving your neighbor like you love yourself. Think about it. You may look in the mirror and like you hate what you see, or you may talk bad about yourself and belittle yourself, but I would argue that you love yourself. Even if you do that, those things. Because think about it. When you're cut, what do you do? You clean it. When you're unclothed, what do you do? Everybody this morning, put something on. If you need shelter, you find a place that you can sleep. If you're hungry, you're going to get some food for yourself. If whatever the need is, if you've got to spend money to provide for yourself, you're going to spend whatever it takes to take care of yourself. That's how you love yourself. See, Jesus, I don't think that he was telling this story so that we would think more about helping people. It's way bigger, way bigger than that. He wants us to think about loving people, going to the extent of loving people like we love ourselves. If it was you in the gutter, what would you do for yourself if you were able to? Jesus said, the world will know that you're my followers. They'll know you're Christians by your love. See, my prayer isn't that we would just be known as nice people. Like everybody out there, especially in Santa Clara, everybody's like trying to be nice. You come across some jerks from time to time. But like people are trying to be nice, right? My prayer is not that we would just be nice people but that we would love people extravagantly like we love ourselves, that we would spare no expense. I think in those moments when we do that, that's when the world is going to take notice. What, you're doing what? That's the kind of love that's going to turn the world to Jesus. Then Jesus asks the expert, he says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of these robbers? Who was a neighbor in the story? Another translation says, who proved to be a neighbor. As if to say, don't focus on defining who your neighbor is at all. I don't care if they have a different skin color. I don't care if it's a different nationality. I don't care if they're in a different tax bracket. I don't care if they vote differently than you. I don't care if they harmed you, if you find them annoying. I don't care if you think they deserve it. The only focus is on you and on me. Are you a neighbor? Will you be a neighbor? To anybody that you come into contact with, when you see a need, how are you going to respond? Will you be a neighbor? God so loved, what are the next two words? You ever think about that? He didn't just love like 
a few. Like these guys aren't absolute jerks, so like I kind of love them, I'll come for them. I'll save these ones over here. He's, he loved the world. That, it shows that his love is absolutely unconditional. Think about the people in the world. You and I have all met some people. We've read some history books. But his love is truly unconditional. Jesus doesn't love us, catch this, he doesn't love us because we deserve it, he loves us because it's who he is. We don't neighbor people because they deserve it, but it's because it's who we are. I want it to be true of me that I don't cross the road because I think you deserve it. I cross the road because I'm a man that whenever I see somebody that's in need, I'm going to cross the road and I'm going to do whatever it takes to help. I hope that's true of me. When it says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, we started with that scripture. I want to invite the worship team to come back up. I'll just finish with this thought. That Greek for made his dwelling among us, it means that he lived, or one translation is that he tabernacled among us. It's this reference to the Old Testament, the tabernacle. And if you're familiar with the tabernacle, tabernacle at all, you know that it's this huge tent filled with all these things that are really symbols. They're shadows of what was to come in Jesus Christ. And so when Israel marched around the wilderness, guess what they had to bring with them? The tabernacle. They got to tear it down. They got to pack it up. There are people carrying stuff on their shoulders and on their backs, whatever. And they're, they're carrying it with them wherever they go. And then they set it back up whenever they stop. And when somebody would walk into the tabernacle, the first thing that you would see is a place to offer a sacrifice, specifically a lamb. The tabernacle also had inside a wash bowl. So whoever entered, they had to wash their hands, even the priests, in order to be clean, enough to enter. Uh, next, there would be the bread of the presence. There'd be this huge golden lamp. There would be uh, incense burning. And next to that was a place called the inner court. And then a person would finally make it to the Holy of Holies. And in the Holy of Holies was the mercy seat. There was a, a wooden box, the Ark of the Covenant, that had ten, the Ten Commandments inside. And this was the place where, I want you to get the picture, that inside the Holy of Holies is where God's presence especially rested. And there was this thick curtain in front of it. So it was like to protect people from being able to get too close. You couldn't even see behind the curtain. You couldn't even see where God's presence was actually resting. And so in the Old Testament, the general principle is stay away from the tabernacle. Keep your distance because after all, it is the holy place. If you're going to go close, like just be careful. But Jesus, he is the human tabernacle. He's the reality of what the tabernacle, the symbol of the tabernacle pointed to, the place where God and people are united. And when throughout history, this is what I want you to catch and why I share that, is that throughout history, the posture towards the tabernacle was step back, keep your distance. This tabernacle, Jesus, he comes close and he draws near and he sets up in the neighborhood. Again, Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. It reveals to us his nature. It's not just like, hey, God did this one time. He was trying to reveal to us something about his nature that I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I am the God who is perpetually drawing near to you. I'm the God who is continually coming and invading the broken and the dark and painful spaces. Why did Jesus cross the road? One word, love. Because of the most incredible love for you and for me. When he's not obligated to help you, he still crosses the road and draws near. When you don't deserve it, when you've stumbled and you've sinned for like the millionth time, he still crosses the road and draws near. When other people hurt you, when you sin and your pain's your own fault, he's always drawing near. And wherever you find yourself this morning, I want you to consider that he wants to reveal himself to you as Emmanuel, as God with you, in your grieving, or in your joy, in the valley, or if you're on the mountaintop, and you're like, man, life is good. Like, this is Christmas. What are we talking about? The sad stuff. Like, this, my life is good. Whatever it is, when you get, when the baby's born and you get the raise, also when you experience the miscarriage or the divorce or the loss, he is Emmanuel, the God who draws near and is with you. Will you please stand with us? Will you close your eyes for a moment? We 
just acknowledge, take a moment to acknowledge Emmanuel, God with you. If you can just visualize this in your mind's eye, imagine yourself on one side of the road and imagine Jesus crossing and walking towards you. A warm smile, gentleness in his eyes. Just sit in that space for a moment. He's the God who draws near. And now as his follower, I just wanna say this first. If, you, if you're here this morning and you maybe feel like you're a little bit on the outside looking in and you haven't actually, you never made the decision to make Jesus your Lord and Savior. I want you to know the good news. The good news is that God loves you and he wants to be in relationship with you. But the problem is, is that you and I have sinned and our sin separates us from God. And no amount of good deeds or being a good person can fix that separation or bring you back into relationship with him. And so God sent Jesus. What we are celebrating this morning, every time we gather, is that Jesus came. He lived the perfect life that you and I could never live. And he died on the cross making payment for our sins. Three days later, he rose from the dead and he ascended to the Father where now he is preparing a place for us. And the day will come when he comes back and brings us to be with him forever. And he did that so that he died on the cross so that anyone who would believe in him and trust in him for forgiveness would be forgiven and they would be saved and you would come back into relationship with God and be in this perfect unbroken relationship with him for all of eternity. And if you're here this morning and you say, you know what, um, if I died, I don't know where I would go. I'm not really confident of where I stand in my relationship with God. I wanna encourage you to reach out to him this morning. If you feel him drawing you and you wanna have that assurance and you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, just tell him, Jesus, I believe in you. You can tell him under your breath, you can tell him in your thoughts because he knows them. But just tell him, Jesus, I believe in you. Please forgive me for my sins and save me. And he will. And if you've made that decision, whether just now or any time in the past, as his follower, I want you to just ask God, pray in your heart, God, what does it look like for me to imitate you? Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, but later he raised the standard even higher in John 15 and he said, my command is this, love each other as I've loved you. Not just as you love yourself, but would you love each other as I've loved you? And so what does it look like for you and I to imitate Jesus? Who is he asking you to draw near to this morning? Where is he asking you to cross the road to love or to forgive or to restore? We're gonna take a few minutes just to respond to God and worship. I wanna encourage you if uh, you would like prayer for anything, um, we're gonna have some prayer teams that are available at either corner of the stage. And if you guys would like to make your way there um, even now, uh, we have people that would love to pray with you. And if you made a decision for the first time to follow Jesus this morning, please let somebody know before you go. We'd love to rejoice with you, pray with you, and resource you. Let's take a few minutes just to respond in worship.